I always get so nervous doing these talks and people say to me, look, Chris, you're an educator, you teach and you talk to students every single week and it's usually about the same group of the same size of audience as this. Um, and then when I get on stage and start to do the talk thing in front of my peers, which is all of you people who I respect, I'm not saying I don't respect my students, I do totally respect my students, but I respect you guys an awful lot more. I get really nervous. Um, I'd like to say thanks to Gavin for inviting me to talk today. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, some of you might know me as half of the standardistas. Uh, Nicholas is in Belfast, sporting facial hair, as we both do. Um, and I'm here talking solo today about a topic that's very close to my heart, which is education. Education gets a, a bit of a bad rap, especially in web design education. Where people tend to think that it's a bit outdated um, and curriculum don't keep up to, to, to speed with what we need to teach. Um, but I think that there is something in education that, that, that is of value. Oh, oh God. On both of those, sorry, Josh, app.net as well. Um, I'm the same person on both of those, app failure. And if you want to have a chat, uh, we are navigators, hashtag we are navigators. I'm also building a new web design curriculum at the minute to deliver in Belfast. I teach in Belfast at the University of Ulster at the Art College. Um, and so if you want to help shape a new design curriculum for the web, I'd be really interested in having a chat with you um, afterwards. Probably that would be really good over a beer, which would be nice. Right now, I should have asked for a beer on the stage. Before I begin, I want to show a short five-minute edit of a film that I think really captures the essence of what good education is about. I believe it's worth sacrificing five minutes of the talk to, to show this, and I checked with Gavin first because I didn't want him to think I was being lazy and getting on stage and then just showing you a film. Um, but I think that you'll agree with me that it, it sort of demonstrates the difference between good education and bad education. And the film is Dead Poets Society, and the scene is the final Oh Captain, My Captain scene. I think even if you haven't seen the film, you'll understand what it's about with that scene. Um, and if you haven't seen the film, I'd urge you to watch it to understand the power that education can have on people's lives. So I'm going to go off stage, and you're going to watch a film for five minutes. Sit. I will be teaching this class through exams. We'll find a permanent English teacher during the break. Who will tell me where you are in the Pritchard textbook? Mr. Anderson. Uh, in the, in the... I can't hear you, Mr. Anderson. In the, in the, in the Pritchard... Kindly inform me, Mr. Cameron. We skipped around a lot, sir. We covered the romantics and some of the chapters on post-Civil War literature. What about the realists? I believe we skipped most of that, sir. All right, then we'll start over. What is poetry? Come. Excuse me. I came for my personals. Should I come back after class? Get them now, Mr. Keating. Gentlemen, turn to page 21 of the introduction. Mr. Cameron, read aloud the excellent essay by Dr. Pritchard on understanding poetry. That page has been ripped out, sir. Well, if I were somebody else's book. They're all ripped out, sir. <laughs> what do you mean, they're all ripped out? Sir, we... Uh... Never mind. Read. Understanding Poetry by Dr. J. Evans Pritchard, Ph.D. To fully understand poetry, we must first be fluent with its meter, rhyme, and figures of speech, then ask two questions. One, how artfully has the objective of the poem been rendered? And two, how important is that objective? Question one rates the poem's perfection. Question two rates its importance. And once these questions have been answered, determining the poem's greatness becomes a relatively simple matter. 
If the poem score for perfection is plotted on the horizontal of a graph... Mr. The Keating, they made everybody Why, sign Anderson. you got to believe me, it's true. I do believe you, Tom. Leave, Mr. Keating. But it wasn't his fault. Sit down, Mr. Anderson. One more outburst from you or anyone else, and you're out of this school. Leave, Mr. Keating. I said leave, Mr. Keating. Captain, my captain. Sit down, Mr. Anderson. You hear me? Sit down. Sit down. This is your final warning, Anderson. Okay. You hear me? Oh, captain, my captain. This no street, I warn you. Sit down. Sit down, all of you. I want you seated. Sit down. Leave, Mr. Keating. I don't know about you, I'm a grown man, and every time I watch that film, I, I start to cry. Um, and I've been training myself <laughs> to watch that clip so many times that I don't cry on stage. Uh, he has had a transformational effect on those students. He has turned them into something that they weren't before they met him. Two different educators. One works from the heart, and one works from the textbook, and both of those lead to very different outcomes. Ask yourself, who would you rather be taught by? Mr. Keating, who invites his students, if they're daring, to call him, oh, captain, my captain. Or Mr. Nolan, who expects to be called nothing but sir. Mr. Nolan sticks to a rigid and formulaic view of education. He espouses a scientific approach to learning, where poetry can be mapped according to the scientific axis of a graph. When Keating tells Nolan earlier in the film, the idea of education is to learn to think for yourself. Mr. Nolan replies, at these boys' age, not on your life. In many ways, Mr. Nolan echoes the world of education today, a mechanical model that doesn't really understand learners' needs and different learning styles. I believe Mr. Nolan's views also fail to reflect the true potential of education to truly transform the learner. Mr. Keating, on the other hand, adopts a different holistic approach to learning. He inspires his students. He helps them to find their passion. He enables them to identify their dreams. And he encourages them to pursue those dreams wholeheartedly. Mr. Keating develops what I like to call a whole mind, which is a topic I'll be covering shortly. I believe in this film and in that scene, we see the essence of two very different approaches towards education. And I'd like to explore that a little today. One approach teaches to a formula and the other understands that education needs to be more fluid and needs to be shaped to the individual. So what I'm going to be covering is broken down into five sections. I'm a big Wittgenstein fan, so I like to put numbers beside everything. I also have a wee bit of OCD as well, so you wouldn't guess it looking at the scruffily way I'm dressed. 
First, I'm going to be looking at revisiting and rethinking models of learning that we currently use. And then I'm going to be considering a return to an older model of learning, the master-apprentice model, and how we might learn from that, and possibly go back to that. Then I'm going to look at a typical learning journey, which is my journey, uh, which might involve some more crying. I haven't actually cried yet, but it could, um, because it's about some people who had a massive impact on me. And then I'm going to look at the importance of teaching through making, about people who teach the topic that we work, the industry that we work in, need to be actually making things. They can't just teach theory. And finally, I'm going to be considering time, the time that we have as individuals on this earth and how we need to use that time effectively uh, for the best of our purpose. I am an academic. I'm an educator. Um, I'm also a web designer as well, okay? Just in case you think I'm some kind of not doing any of this business, okay? I'll show you some of that later. Um, but yeah, educators get such a bad rap. But as an, I quite like calling myself an academic. I have a tweed jacket, and it's sitting in the green room. It's too hot to wear it today. Um, and I would love to have like a study with a roaring fire where students could come in and I could just do long tutorials for hours on end. Um, in addition to my work as a designer and all of that, I, obviously as an academic, I, you know, I read quite a lot of stuff. Um, you don't need to be an academic to read, um, but you're sort of expected to if you're an academic. So I wanted to talk about some texts that have informed this particular talk today. These three books, when you read them, um, are about finding purpose, finding meaning and a goal in life, and pursuing that goal as effectively as possible. I'd really strongly urge you to buy them, and if you follow those jump links, j.mp, finding your passion, I get some money in the Amazon thing. Awesome. This first book is called The Element. It's by Sir Ken Robinson. And it's about finding your passion, finding the thing that motivates you, finding the thing that really excites you. If you can pursue passion, your calling, then work isn't really going to be work anymore. It's going to be something you really love doing. And time will just fly by. I'll return to that theme shortly, but I think it's critical that educators play a role in helping students to understand what their passion truly is. Robert Greene's book, Mastery, you can buy it for the Kindle, um, but I would say get the book. The printed book's quite a nice object. Um, J.mp slash on mastery. Uh, revisits the tried and tested model of the master apprentice model of learning. And I think that that's something that we could probably return to in education. And finally, Peter Drucker's book, Managing Oneself. It's a very short but very powerful book. It's only about this size. Again, I think you can get that for free on the web. It's a Harvard Review PDF. Um, but by the book, it's just a beautiful thing. Uh, you can read it in the time it takes to get on the plane to Belfast at 7.10 in the morning and get yourself a gin and tonic at 7.10 in the morning, which I did because uh, I felt like I'd earned it. And also, I felt like I was out of time at that point in time. And, and read the whole thing by the time you get to Newcastle. And it will change your thinking. It's about managing yourself and about managing your relationship with other people. And it's about becoming as effective as possible. I believe that formal education has potential, but I think it needs a little love and attention. I think we need to revisit how we teach and rediscover how best to inspire the next generation that's coming through. Sir Ken Robinson, if you haven't seen the talks by Sir Ken Robinson um, on TED.com, go and watch them. It's like half an hour of your life, which will change your understanding of education and its potential. He talks about the difference between an industrial model of learning and an agricultural model of learning in a 2006 talk, well worth watching. He says, we need to move from an industrial model of education, a manufacturing model that is based upon manufacturing principles where things go like this and happen in a linear fashion uh, towards a more agricultural model where we start to cultivate a mind and put in place the pieces for a mind to flourish. He says, we have to recognize that human flourishing is not a mechanical process. It's an organic process. We need to understand that learning isn't built on templates. It's built on people. And we need to grasp for the mind to truly flourish Flourish, that's like your specificity word, Harry. It's tough, especially with, when you haven't had a drink. Yeah. Can we get drinks on the stage? For a, a mind to truly flourish, we need to grow it. Education as it currently stands, because I'm working in this industry, is based on this manufacturing model. It's built on linearity. It's built on conformity. 
Educators build curriculum, they build systems, they have modules, there's, there's this whole kind of language which personally I hate. Um, and I think that's wrong because we as individuals are not one size fits all. We're different and so we need to tailor education to the individual. I think we need to move towards an agricultural model of education where we establish a framework for learning and allow the person at the heart to flourish and grow. We need to cultivate learners and tend to their different, differing needs. My wife is a, is a gardener. Um, she has like a vegetable patch. And so she goes out and I'm like, no, I'm not helping you dig those things. I'm on the computer. I'm working. Um, she's digging the stuff and she, she, she tries to grow potatoes. And she does successfully grow potatoes. We eat them. Uh, I don't want you to think my wife is a failure at being a vegetable gardener, because she's not. Um, you can't be 100% sure that the potatoes are going to come out, but you can put the framework in place for the potatoes to grow. And I think that that's, a, that's an interesting way of thinking about how we grow a mind. This is a huge change culturally, because it is going to force us to revisit education and how we currently deliver it to move towards a slightly different model that is more bespoke. I recently had a discussion with Alan Livingston, who, if you don't know him, is a really, really inspiring guy. He's one of Britain's leading design educators, and he's now a visiting professor at my university. And if you've ever spoken to Alan, I know that Adam is here, and he knows him. He's awesome, isn't he, Adam? He's the most awesome guy. Um, and we're having a conversation about teaching, and he said to me, you're a designer, Chris. And I said, yeah. I can listed some things I do as a designer. I said, I'm a graphic designer, you know, web designer, you know, I do design services, I, you know, I design lots of things. And I completely misunderstood what Alan was saying. It's a measure of his thinking and experience, he's a lot older than me, uh, that he was quite a few steps ahead of me. He said, you don't understand me, Chris. You're a designer of minds. This just totally blew my mind. I was like, Poof. My, my brain just exploded all over the table. I was like, what? I was like, I never thought of it that way before. I've never thought that the people who come in as raw material are students. We're shaping them and we're designing them, just like we would design anything else. That had a massive impact on me. He also said, last time I met him, he had just had a heart operation, and he quietly leaned into me. He sort of does that, doesn't he, Adam? He sort of leans in and he goes, he also gets very close to you as well. You know that physical, you know when people get, and you're going like this, and then you're at, there's a wall, and you can't go any further back, and he's like right there. And he said, uh, never be ashamed to call yourself an educator. I thought that was interesting. As educators, we are designing minds. That is a huge responsibility, and it's something we shouldn't really enter into lightly. I believe that that, though, is something that we can all contribute to, whether or not you are an educator or not. I mean, I've come as a, I wish they weren't videoing this, right? But, you know, I have no training as an educator. I was just like a graphic designer, web designer person, and then got a job as a teacher working in a university. There was no training about how to do this thing. The most training I got was watching that film, Dead Poet Society. That was the best training I got. But you don't need to be an educator working in a university to contribute to education. I believe we need to teach a whole mind. Our business is very complex, it's very messy, and it gets messier and more complex every year. Teaching to a rigid curriculum and sticking to that rigid curriculum uh, to deliver to our students doesn't really work. We need to move towards something a little bit more fluid, and we need to discover ways to design minds. Most educators who teach web design will tell you, well, I hope they would tell you this. Um, some of them are a bit shit. Um, edit that out. Um, we'll tell you that this is the stuff we need to teach. We need to teach technique. We need to teach skills. I think not all web designer educators would teach you about craftsmanship. I, I'm not sure that they all would. I don't know that they would all teach you about business, but I think that they should. And these are the core skills that we need in order to function in the world that we work in. And they would then think that that was a pretty good job. But I think we need to teach this other bit as well. Call me old fashioned, some might disagree, but I think we should be teaching self-confidence, belief, manners, politeness. Very, very old fashioned, totally. Nobody ever says thank you anymore. 
It's an awful shame. By the way, thank you, Gavin, for organizing all this. Awesome work. We need to instill confidence, self-belief. We need to instill these soft skills in our students because those are the kinds of things that, that, that come together that make somebody a really good practitioner. If we teach this bit and we teach this bit and we put them together, I think what we get is a whole mind. And I think at the minute, most curricula are only teaching a tiny fragment of that. When we begin to engage with a whole mind, we start to see things differently. We start to see what our students' passions are, and we can guide them to their calling. Fantastic talk by Jessica Hish at New Adventures, who was there recently. And she talked about the difference between a job, and she said, yeah, I'm doing it for the nine to five, man, I'm living for the weekend, you know. And then a career, which was a step up from that, you know, it was something slightly better than a job. And then she talked about a calling. And it was really interesting listening to her speaking because she talked about the fact that two o'clock in the morning, I'm sure we've all done this because you're in this room, so this is self-selecting because you're here because you're good, okay? But two o'clock in the morning and you're working on this side project, that is not work. That's your calling. That is something you're passionate about and it doesn't even really feel like time is actually moving. You're just there. A career is a thing we do solely for money and can be often unfulfilling. A calling, on the other hand, satisfies your human needs very deeply. An educator who cares, like the Robin Williams character in the film that we showed earlier, can help guide you to a calling. And that can make a huge difference in your life. I believe, and I spoke about this with my other Tweed Club partner, Nicholas Persson, um, at Build Conference two years ago, that we need to rediscover an old way of learning. The history of the master-apprentice model of learning goes back a long, long way. Looking back to history, I think we can learn from it. There's a long tradition of this model of learning, and it still exists in some industries today. My wife is a silversmith, and there is a definite master-apprentice culture in that industry. So it's not like industries generally don't use this model of learning. Maybe we could start to re-embrace it. The apprentice was traditionally given to the master. Often the parents of the apprentice, who was generally a young child, would pay the master some money in order that he would then instill the skills into that young child. And what that would do is that would change that child's direction and send them in a different pathway. The master imparted craft and skills and if you read Richard Sennett's excellent book, The Craftsman, he talks about Stradivarius and how, Strad you know, the violin guy? He talks about Stradivarius. You can tell I don't play a violin. Uh, I don't play any musical instruments at all. Um, Stradivarius was making these amazing violins, okay? And there are all these notebooks that he left behind. So we should be able to make a Stradivarius, okay? Because all the notes are there. But no one has yet been able to make a violin that has that sound because there were other things that you can't put into a textbook in terms of feel, in terms of touch, in terms of intuition, in terms of things that are very difficult to pin down in, in some kind of curriculum. So it's not just about the skills, but it's about the feel for the job at hand. But it doesn't end there, because the qualities that your master impacts to you, imp inputs to you, the soft skills can be hugely invaluable too. Training you as a person, reining in your young arrogance. These are the sorts of things that you can't learn from web-based tutorials, but they're absolutely critical. An apprentice served time traditionally for seven years with a master. And once their time was served, the apprentice was ready to go and embark on a journey and they would then become what's known as a journeyman. This tradition of the young, hopeful hero embarking on a journey of discovery guided by a wise mentor is one that goes back a long, long time ago. It goes back even before this scene here, which is 1500, 1600, something like that. It goes back to a galaxy far, far away. Okay. When Luke embarks upon his journey, he is not ready to fulfill his goal. He's young, he's impetuous, he's very headstrong. 
He thinks he knows everything there is to know. I can tell you, working with students, that's quite normal, okay? They know, every, they know way more than you. And I usually threaten them and say, I'm so going to fucking punch you if you don't follow the instructions I've given you. Yeah, I tell you, you're so not meant to do that. Sorry, educational people in the world, yeah? I have threatened some people. And then they have come back to me afterwards and said, man, you changed my life. I, was, I mean, that, you know, I, yeah, I was just being a dick. And I'm like, I know, it's okay. I was young too. So you, Luke is young, he's impetuous, he's headstrong. And it's Obi-Wan who takes him and gives him the skills he needs to know in order for him to be able to fly down that thing and hear in his head, use the force, Luke. And then press that button, thing goes like that into the rubbish can thing, whatever that was. We can think of the master-apprentice relationship as being one way. All the knowledge from this master goes into the mind of the apprentice. But anyone who's ever mentored anybody or worked in a master-apprentice relationship will tell you that it actually goes both ways. Because the master is learning and the apprentice is learning. Both of them are learning. The master imparts skill, imparts life qualities, imparts a whole range of things. But what the apprentice does, because he or she is young and doesn't know the way we do things, sees things in a different way. You could call it naive. And they then shape the master as well. And that becomes like this. They start to shape each other. Joseph Albers. Anybody know who Joseph Albers is? Please, some people. Oh my God, people. Right. Design history. Yeah, that's our first module in the course that we're writing. We go through the entire history of communication design from cave paintings to the present day. Joseph Albers from the Bauhaus, a uh, German designer, moved to America. Says the first years you work in a craft, you're an apprentice, this takes three or four years. Then you're a journeyman, you move from one master to another and learn their tricks and secrets. And so the journey begins. To illustrate this, I want to look a little bit about my journey and how my mentors helped shape me. They helped me find meaning, they helped me find purpose, and above all, they helped me find direction. This is a bit where I thought I was going to cry, but I think I'm okay. This is a man called Mark Sheverton. He was my first mentor. I didn't know it then, but I know it now. He helped me find direction. I was nine, young child. My wife said, don't say this, but I was like Paddington Bear. You know he has the lapel around his neck, so if he gets lost, he can find his way home. My parents were in Hong Kong, and I was sent to boarding school on the other side of the world, literally the other side of the world. This was years ago, when if you phoned somebody, there was a big, long delay for the, for the voice to go over the planet. It was bizarre. So I had no real father figure. Apologies, Dad, if you're watching this. Mark became a father figure to me. He was my art teacher. He was a huge inspiration to me. Without him, I would n I, there's just no way I would be here where I am now. He listened to me. He encouraged me. Yes, one time, as a Christian, a very devout Christian, he said to me one day over the printing press, for fuck's sake, Chris, will you ever just finish the fucking stuff off? I was kind of like, Jesus, I must have done something wrong. Sorry, I shouldn't have said Jesus. Sorry about that. I thought, Jesus, I must have done something wrong. So I left him, and I went to Glasgow School of Art. Um, three years after I had ended my journey with him in 1988, um, he and his wife, Lottie, were tragically killed in a car crash. I remember that day like it was yesterday. I'd come home from Glasgow School of Art, was having my lunch, I was watching the TV, a news article came on, and it said, tragic accident, Mark and Lottie Sheverton have died. And I was stunned. Didn't know what, to, I was, it was all over the place, in, in floods of tears. This is not a normal educator. Normal educators, when you hear they die, you're like, oh, yeah, that guy, he was a bit of a shit, you know. It was a fantastic Neville Brodie exhibition on in Edinburgh when he was teaching me. And he said, oh, you should go and see this. And I went to, that, to the fruit market gallery in Edinburgh, saw this exhibition. And I was like, that is it. That's what I want to do. I want to be a graphic designer. And that completely changed my direction. That work there was the opposite of what Mark was doing. Mark was a printmaker. But he knew what I needed, and he sent me in that direction. 
My second mentor was a guy called Barry Smith, and he taught me my craft. I lived with him in Canada for a while, and I phoned him the other day, and he was like, holy shit, Chris, because we haven't talked for about over a decade. And every day he came into the studio and he gave me things. He would sit down and he would say, draw that Vattel logo. And I was like, what? And what I didn't realize at the time was I was doing that master apprentice thing where you relentlessly copy something. And through copying, you learn the skills that you need to, to go on to make your own things. In addition to focus, focusing on developing my skills, he also shared his business knowledge with me. He was the most sharing guy I've ever known. You know, he opened up his books. He showed me his books. That's the accounting books I'm talking of, not the other books. Um, he explained to me how the, the studio worked. He explained to me how to control jobs. He told me all of this stuff. Some, some people would think that is sensitive business information. But he knew that if I was to run a studio myself, I needed to have that knowledge. Beziers, that's all I can remember. From Barry, but from Barry, I talked to him the other day, and I was like, Bessie is Barry. Jesus, fucking hated it. He taught me to draw on a computer. This was in the days when computers were quite new, okay? Because I'm kind of old. And my last mentor was a guy called Rodney Miller. He sadly passed away a couple of years ago. Uh, he died of cancer. Um, and I still remember the last time I met him. He came in to see me one day in the college, and he was a shadow of himself. He was dying, I could see it. Um, and I, I was struggling to hold it together. And we were in a meeting, and I said, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna nip out for a wee smoke. And he said, you know what, I'll just come with you. And I was like, Rodney, is that a good idea? Because like, you've got cancer. And we sat outside and we had a cigarette together. And I'll never forget that moment. He taught me the importance of values. He showed me that if you believe in someone, you should invest in them. I had a crazy idea that I wanted to run a record label. And he decided, you know what? I'm going to give you a day off a week. Just don't tell anybody else in the studio that I'm paying you for the full five days a week. And you just do the record label stuff on Friday. And this is like 20% time Google stuff before they were doing that. Google wasn't even invented then. And he paid for all of this. He bankrolled this record label because he believed in me. Combined, these mentors had a sort of slingshot effect. You know you send a rocket to a planet, and it goes around the planet, and then it goes really fast in a different direction? It's like you go around this rocket, Mark, and he sends you here. And then you go around this rocket, Barry, and he sends you here. And you go around this rocket, Rodney, and then you're suddenly hurtling out into the universe. Those three people coming together have sent you in a direction that is more than the sum of the parts. I believe in paying it forward, taking inspiration from other people who inspired me in the past, and then doing my best to pass that knowledge on to the people that are following me. I believe that we all have opportunities, whether or not we are educators, to contribute to our industry, to share our knowledge freely, to empower a new generation of designers. We need to rediscover the powerful role that mentors can have within the design education process. And if Sybil Weber is here, who we're working on the mentoring thing. We could talk about making it better, you know, because of my crazy ass schedule. But I think there's some value in it. And we had some really good talks about your website. And those little jewel things are looking really nice. We're so fortunate in our industry that we can benefit from a culture of making and sharing. There are very few other industries where people sort of say, hey, here's how I made this stuff. You know, here's my trade secrets. I believe as a, a teacher, to truly be able to teach, especially in this industry, we need to make, learn, and share. We, we cannot not make. Because if we stop making, we can't keep up. We can't teach the students who are following the stuff that they need to know. We need to continually practice our craft, learning anew throughout our careers. It's a bloody nightmare, isn't it? Keeping on top of this stuff. But you know what? We have to do it. And it's the educators who go, God, what a bloody nightmare. Just you know, get us a glass of wine, would you? You know, those are the people you don't want to teach you. This can take many forms. It could be writing about stuff you find, which Nick and I do, and sharing it with people on the internet. Well, technically the web. 
It could be writing a book. Make sure we say that five simple steps got a plug in my talk. Um, so it could be writing a book about the craft of words, which I did with Nicholas, which taught us some new stuff about words as a design element. You should buy that book. It's a very, very good book. It might be getting in the mess, messy in the trenches and building a shiny new web application. You should go and take a look at Get Invited, the stand over there. That's two of my students. Well, one is technically a graduate now, and the other, yeah, he's almost a graduate, unless he fucks it up royally in the next two weeks. You're home and dry, Kyle, OK? So this is a web application that we're building for ticketing. Man, I learned a lot doing that. Or it could be conjuring up an excuse Oh, Jesus, those slides look really terrible. To buy that little printer, you know the little printer thing? And my wife said to me, there's no way you're buying that little printer. And I was like, OK. When she found out it was 200 quid. And I was like, OK. So I went into my studio, and I made a publication for a little printer so that the next morning at 4 o'clock in the morning when I came to bed, she was like, what have you been doing? I was like, oh, I'm making a publication for a little printer, and I've been dealing with the guys from Berg, and they're going to release it on a little printer. I need to buy a little printer now. Awesome. I have one of those. It's so cool. An educator who is not a maker is only telling half the story. We need to share freely, not just the technical knowledge, but all of the knowledge that one needs to succeed in this industry. When I think back on my mentors, Mark, Barry, and Rodney, they shared absolutely everything with me. They kept nothing a secret. They told me what it means to have a goal in life, why craft matters, and the importance of values. And they were my friends. And so when, they, when two of them passed away, God, I'm really trying to hold it together here. Uh, when two of them passed away, that had a huge impact on me. We need to encourage an understanding that hard work can't be bypassed. We need to encourage people to understand that education can't be bought. It has to be earned. We need to give back. In closing, I want to talk about breakfasts. I'm not a big breakfast person. Gavin, I could have saved you some money because I didn't actually eat my breakfast. And I'm not going to eat it tomorrow either. I just wake up with a hangover and I'm like, oh my god, why was I drinking so much last night? I'm going to go on stage tomorrow. Fantastic article by Trent Walton called You Are What You Eat. If you haven't read it, Google it and read it. In it, he talks about breakfasts. He talks about what you make is what you will be asked to make. So if you're not happy with what you're doing, make stuff that you want to make, because then other people will ask you to make that too. But he talks about breakfast, and he says that the US citizen, the average US citizen man, will have 28,616 breakfasts in their entire lifetime. The good news for me is that in the UK, we have a higher life expectancy. Brilliant. We get more than 28,616. The bad news for me is I smoke like a chimney, I drink far too much, and I just generally have a very unhealthy lifestyle. So I, if I was a good li liver, could get 31-something breakfast, 1,000 breakfasts. I've already used up 15,876 today. That's accurate to today. So I have only got 15,149 left. That's assuming I stop drinking as much as I do and give up smoking, which is not going to happen. So I'm on the way out. Oh dear, what a shame. I said that to Cara the other day. I said, I'm, in the, I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm at the end of my life. And she said, what? And I was kind of like, yeah, I'm in the second half. You know, look at this calculation. So it's important that we make every single day count. We often see this tarred old cliche rolled out. Those who can do, those who can't teach. Anyone who's ever done any teaching knows that whenever somebody says that to you, 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 you have to overcome a strong urge to punch them repeatedly in the face because they don't really understand how difficult education is. I don't believe Mr. Mencken, who said that, had any experience of teaching. I also think it's a rather negative sentiment those who can't do, those who can't teach, you know, could we be more positive than that? And so I changed a couple of letters, and I ended up with this. Those who can do, those who care, teach. As a teacher, you have a responsibility, a huge responsibility. You're not just delivering lectures, facilitating tutorials, or giving a critique on a piece of work. 
You're shaping a life. Sometimes you're changing a student's trajectory. That is very serious. Of my three mentors, two out of three were not teachers. They worked in industry just like you. You don't need to be a lecturer to contribute to education. You just need a willingness to get involved. We can all give something back. We can all make a difference. You only have a limited number of breakfasts. Ask yourself, what can you do to help shape and build our industry? Thank you. Whoa, can I just say that was bang on 40 minutes? And I was shit myself yesterday because I thought it was 21. It's pretty solid. It's pretty solid. That's a professional for you. So I've got a question. Not about a job, but who enjoys what they do in this room? Right, now hands down. Who enjoys their job? About half. I do. Who has. Who hires people in this room? Do you find it difficult? Keep your hands up if you do. Yeah. Chris and I have had this conversation for quite a while, haven't we? It's been going on for Long about time. two years. <laughs> yeah, it's um, longer than two years. Hate to. We've used a lot of breakfasts on it. We have. What is the thing that you find hardest with education? The thing I find hardest with education is that you with our system that we have at the minute, is that you build curriculum, and that has to be written down on a piece of paper in a document, and then you, you're expected not to veer from that. Um, and so the, uh, you know, someone will say to you, oh, we can't teach that there, that new emerging technology, because uh, it doesn't say it in the document. Um, and so that is a big challenge. Um, but the way to overcome that challenge is just to go, fuck it, we'll just do it anyway. That's what I do. Yeah, I just ignore that document. It's a guideline. You know, again, Jesus, don't show this to the VC of the University of Ulster. Has anybody got Sack. any questions? We've got, go on, Libby. Hi, Libby. I do that too. In this module, we will teach some, teach some technical skills. I won't lie and say that there are times I've thought, fuck this, I want to do Chris Murphy's magical bus of uh, web design. <laughs> awesome, let's, let's trademark that. Um, but there are some benefits to being in, in, a, in a building that has all of the facilities that you need and that has a library and has all the things that one needs in order to teach properly. I won't lie and say that I'm not frustrated that of the 100 students I see in final year who I teach every year, I know that 10 of them are going to be amazing and 40 are going to be OK and 50 are basically just turning up to get a degree. Um, but those 10 make a huge difference. You know, I'm very proud of the work that my students are doing. I answered the last question of the legacy. Mm -hmm. Is that Gavin was interviewing me for the website? I was so slow at replying to the questions. We finished it yesterday, and the one question was, what, should, "What would your legacy be?" And you know, I mean, I've done some stuff in my work, which is great, but my students, I think, are great. You know, they're, they're going on to do amazing things. You know, but yeah, it's frustrating, but you can you can work against it. You know, we we've also had lots of conversations about this. <laughs> it's one thing that. We'll close it there, but just one thing that I think I would like to put across is those people that do hire and find it hard to hire, have a look and speak to the local universities, colleges, and see what the curriculums are within those institutions. See if they are fitting what you require. Because the only way they're going to find out otherwise is if we tell them. Because if not, there's going to be a, a pretty large void in the ground where the people that are supposed to be coming through aren't with the skills that aren't particularly required. So, you know, it's, it's up to us as an industry to get back to academia and tell them what we need. So, 